Hi everyone, just before we get this next history hack out and going, just reminded to say that we are on Patreon. If you head to patreon.com forward slash history hack, you can see all the amazing tiers that start from just three pounds a month. But we know that supporting a pod that you might not listen to all of the episodes on, for shame, you may want to just tip us for an episode. So we have signed up with Ko-Fi. So if you go to ko-fi.com forward slash history hack, you can tip us for an episode that you've listened to and quite liked. So whichever way you're able to support us, whether that's just sharing the pod with your friends or being able to support us financially, we cannot thank you enough. So without further ado. Hello and welcome to History Hack. It is a hedge hopping sortie today and we're going to be looking at something maybe a little different to what you've come to get to know with these episodes. Because when we look back at the Nazi war machine, history tends to be colored by the shades of gray of the good Wehrmacht or the clean Luftwaffe or the bad SS. The personal sheen of the 50s and 60s gave us gallant heroes and gallant the Gagarian. But pushing back against the darkness, we've started to see that there was a lot more to it. And I'm delighted to say that's what we're going to be talking about today. Because the belief that the Luftwaffe was the best of a bad bunch has kind of persisted. Until now, I'm delighted that Dr. Philip Blood is joining us today to discuss his new book, Birds of Prey, where he looks at the actions of the Luftwaffe in a specific forest in East Prussia. And we find that they're committing the same crimes that we once thought them innocent of. Welcome very much, Phil. Thank you for taking the time with us. How are you doing? I'm very well, Matt. Thank you very much for inviting me. Oh, you, you're very welcome. I've we're going to get into the book in a minute, which you very kindly sent me beforehand and has been keeping me up at night, frankly. But before we do that, the traditional question, how has Aachen been over the last little while? Well, actually, we've had uh, in this region, we've had the disaster rains, which demolished many communities, quite literally wiped out communities because of floods. Um, for the whole period of lockdown it's not been too good um i don't think we've suffered in germany like it has in like people have in britain we've seemed to have we seem to have, ha uh, have coped with it a little bit better um there hasn't been the crazy behavior that you see and reported in twitter and what have you I, we, we've just sort of gone ahead we wear our masks we've taken our vaccines we've just gone on with life um a lot of people obviously have suffered we've we've had huge community losses from um shops disappearing small businesses disappearing friends pubs disappearing um there's a lot of that um, whether it'll recover i'm not too sure the government has tried very hard with a funding scheme to look after the community but I'm not sure it's enough. Uh, ourselves in the house, well, as you know, I'm more housebound these days because of circumstances, but my partner, Bettina, she's running around doing sports, um, keeping me uh, busy, making sure that I do my full amounts of work and writing every day. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Uh, a good woman cracking the whip that's what i saying. am ruled and <laughs> <laughs> uh, i'm i'm in, in case wendy's listening to this one i'm going to say we have a wonderful partnership and i'm very happy <laughs> to have it <laughs> um right so let's let, let's get cracking i i said in the intro that this one's this this book's been keeping me up at night because it's yeah you know, as we said before in, when we were chatting it's not really bedtime reading but it is utterly fascinating and equally horrifying because we tend to think of the Luftwaffe in terms of aircraft air power that element of it your sort of research into the the units that were operating in the forests in east prussia actually has a much sort of longer lead when it comes into looking at germany and their fetishization of the hunt isn't it because we have to start much earlier than say the birth of the Luftwaffe in, in the 30s well in the first book and in the first ph in my first uh, in my phd research what have you i came across something called the flieger group seven and nobody had 
at that stage, nobody had written too much about Flieger Group 7, um, but they were, the, they were the air combat support wings um, flying with the SS. They were Luftwaffe flyers, but bound to the SS. And leading SS officers like Eric von den Baxilewski were given Jun a Junkers 52 or Faisler Storch, the small reconnaissance mm -hmm. airplane, to, for, for different jobs. One, one job was to be able to fly long distances, so he would be covering Minsk, Biavisha, Bialystok, Berlin, in the JU-52, the Tanta U, and the Pfizer store she would use for running um, counterinsurgency kind of operations before Bandon Bekanthon was introduced. So I started to look at this organisation, this Flieger group, and I discovered that they were also involved in the bombing of Warsaw in 1944 with Stukas. So the more I started to look at the, the, the role of the Luftwaffe in operations, the more I noticed that the Luftwaffe had a high intensity involvement in operations. So if you look at the Kofpak raid, where the partisans march 1,500 miles into German territory, it's the Luftwaffe using Messerschmitt Momonos and JU-88, trying to cover the area to find out where the partisans had gone. Once they'd located them, they would strafe or bomb them and try and disperse them, break them up, stop them from being a combined, organised body. And I thought, this is all deliberate tactics. But, and this is, it's a big but, when you go to the Luftwaffe archives, there's not much left. Um, German officers in April, May 1945 deliberately destroyed them. So what you have are shreds of evidence, and I couldn't go any further. Um, I think one lad on the internet has discovered a little bit more about them and discovered who the pilots were and have you, but that's not adequate for empirical history. You, you, you need to do you need to go beyond the pilots. You have to understand what the tactics are, the strategy and what have you. So that lead was cut. Then as I started to look at these two security battalions operating in Poland, it suddenly dawned on me that not only did I, I had the information, I could understand what the Luftwaffe were doing in the field. I knew that the, op the orders were coming directly from Goering and I knew the relationship between Goering the fighter wings, the bomber wings that were all connecting to these activities through Luftgau Eins, which is the air district East Prussia, based in Königsberg. But <laughs> there's another blockage because you can't really put the meat behind that skeleton of information because the files have disappeared. So I decided to trace the individuals who were prominent through the process. And two of them were the majors in command of the two battalions. One had been a flyer um, operating in the Balkans and working on the Falsham Jaeger operations in the Balkans and in Crete as a security officer. That's behind the wheel making sure that the ground is safe for flight, you know, all that stuff, good stuff. The other one was a hunter. So I delved into this chap's background and he had written considerable numbers of pamphlets and booklets since 1925. So the more I looked into the, to the, that hunting point with that guy, the more I started to ask questions about the German hunt. And at one point, I can't remember when it was, probably around about 2010, I decided that I had to go full on German social history of the German hunt. And so what I discovered was the hunt had been liberalized in 1848. And in the rise of Germany in the 1840s. Could, could I just ask, what, what do you mean by liberal? the hunt being liberalized? Well, it had been an aristocratic um, prominence. 
in the sense that the prime lands of hunting were controlled by the aristocracy. Mm -hmm. Okay. And they would not allow anybody but themselves to hunt those grounds. And during the Liberal Revolution of 1848, one of the few things, <laughs> one of the few things that the Frankfurt Assembly um, committed to was the liberalization of the hunt, which was part of this idea of German manhood, German folk. And I'm talking, uh, you know, I'm talking about in terms of not folk, the people, but folk, like as in folk music, folklore, mm -hmm. which later becomes folkish ideas. Um, th those concepts started to emerge there as um, threads in middle class identity. And hunting enabled middle class men to find a pastime and a profession outside of their workplace. So they're creating a profession as engineers, railway men, chief engineers, bankers, civil servants, even becoming professional soldiers. But the concept of profession, having a profession like a, a chartered accountant or something, um, was being developed within the pastime of hunting. And the requirements of the profession were that you became a prolific hunter through tr learning to track, learning to shoot, learning to kill an animal within 250 paces with one bullet, um, and you had, to, you had to have the right equipment, the right regalia, the right etiquette, the right manners, blah, blah, blah. And so having discovered how this, this whole genre of German society suddenly expanded after 1848 and how it impinged in the military and... Um, the Navy and the civil service and in government and in business. And then seeing how all of the leaders of these elites and the middle class would merge to get, come together at prominent moments on a hunt and create policies and ideas for German society. Well, I suddenly realized, hang on a minute, this isn't just hunting. This is, this is an extra governmental activity. This is a societal activity. This is a culture which is working against what you think is happening on the ground level. You think there's universal suffrage, which there is in Germany. Yes, there is, probably before Britain. But while there's an expansion of democracy or appearance of democracy on the ground level in the working class, middle class and the upper classes, what you've actually got is this strange grouping of um, middle class, upper class, aristocracy and royalty working as another form of shadow government, if you like, for want of a better term. And up until 1914, <laughs> even though they're Germans, they didn't have a code. And what struck me as odd was there's no code, but they were creating precedent which says we're creating an honor code without actually creating an honor code, but we have an honor code. I mean, I know that sounds crazy. Seems that, very un-German. Yeah, because you think, hang on a minute, why haven't they written loads of stuff? But they are reading, writing books. It's just that nobody's got a, con a definition of what is the German hunt. What they have is the Bavarian hunt, uh, the Hessian hunt, and the Rhinish hunt and whoever. But they don't, or well, they didn't have until 1914, a German hunt. And this chap, this forester, comes along called Reisfeld, and he produces a book which basically codifies the hunt up until that stage. And it's a pretty barren uh, affair. You know, you go through the process, you act professionally, you track, you identify the animal. You kill the animal, you you gut it because that's the way to keep it help, to keep the the, the meat fresh, um, and then you put it on a cart, and then you go off and you have a drink, and that's the end of the day. So no, 
There's no ceremonies, and Roosevelt's making it very clear that any false ceremonies are not Germanic. <laughs> it, it, that sort of sounds like et- sort of hunting etiquette more than hunting hunting rules or or anything like that. Yes, but etiquette and rules are, are swirling. Yeah, mm. they're, they're they're making themselves, and somewhere along the line, there are those people who come along and say, "That's a rule." That's not just etiquette. That's a rule. That's how you should behave. And these people start emerging during the First World War. And what you get is it's great to be a hunter in the First World War because, first of all, you can subsidize rations. Mm -hmm. Um, You can run around fairly free, Um, unlike the soldiers in the trenches, an officer who can hunt can go off and, and have a hunting weekend um, on, on the pretext that he's going to bring back um, game for the troops. If you look at the hunting journals, which came out every two weeks in Germany, every two weeks, a full booklet, pamphlet, um, bigger than A4, full of pictures, full of hunting stories, you'd think hunting was the primary purpose of the First World War. You know, the war's on, so now it's a good time to hunt. So let's be German, let's be Germanic, let's go hunting. And they're hunting. Everybody's hunting. The the Kaiser's hunting. In fact, the Kaiser's killing more animals in the period of the First World War than he is at any other time. And in his lifetime, he kills 80,000 animals. Goodness. So you see the sheer scale of of animal life that these that certain hunters are are building in their records. Um, there's a hunting community in the east, which originally was founded by Ludendorff and Hindenburg, and literally German officers and generals and and kings, uh, you know, the various different federal kings turning up to this hunting reserve and shooting wild animals for R&R. And we've used a, you know, we use geographical information systems, maps, gears, and we've mapped where all these animals have been hunted. And locked into that story, we had two stories, (laughs) two little stories. And this may or may not interest you, but it's Richthofen. And Richthofen arrives in the east to shoot a stag. And he's he's being watched. You know, you, know, you, you think he's being observed in the in the air battles. When he hunts this stag, every bit of his movements are being recorded. So how he picks up his rifle, the eye to rifle shooting, killing, coordination, they're all recorded. And some chap writes this huge report on on the ability of the fighter pilot to kill a stag with one shot. Well, of course, he gets his Paul Emerite and is very famous and what have you. And he goes off to, he's invited by the Duke of Pless to shoot a European bison. And the bison are very rare by this stage. You know, they've been mm. pillaged in Russia on the east. And there's this one herd left, but they've granted him the right, because of who Richthofen is in 1918, to kill this bison. And I couldn't believe it. I was reading this story in Miss Daisy, or Princess Daisy, which is a book about a, an English lady who was married to the Prince of Press. She wrote this book in the 20s. And she's telling the story of how Richthofen arrived. So I went to Richthofen's book, and there's the story of him shooting a bison. So if you like, I didn't have the file because a lot of the First World War records of the German army had disappeared, but I had the story of two different accounts from the bison killing. Then I had the account of the stag killing, And I could see 
how Richthofen helped dealt with this hunt. And now it might sound strange, but there was no ceremony. There was no hailing and wailing and all the rest of it. I think when the European bison was killed, a bugle sounded, but that was that was the halali, which is to say there's been a kill, so everybody must move and gather and quickly sort out the animal, A, to make sure it's dead, which is you know, partly a humanistic thing, um, but also to gut it, to stop, you know, to stop the meat from rapidly deteriorating. So I had all this story of Richthofen and I could work out what the First World War fighter is, um, how he was being depicted, how he was being looked at, how he was being understood as this hunter in the skies. Um, so when I first read again the German, the Luftwaffe operator, the, the major of the 2nd Battalion in, in the forest in the Second World War, I, could, I knew where he was coming from because I've been able to track the development behind him since 1848 up to the point where he becomes Goering's personal hunter. And that in there led me to understand the kind of hunter that Gallant was, because Gallant was a prolific hunter, and so was Joachim Marseille, and so was Hartmann, and so was Gunter Rahl. And Gunter Rahl was a big hunter in Bavaria. And then Eugen Mindel, and then Ramka. But then another group came out who were the anti-hunters. And you see people like Ernst Dudet, Hugo Junkers, um, but most of all, perhaps the, the most prominent anti-hunter um, was Hans Ulrich uh, Rudel. So you could see that there's one group and there's another group. So, okay, I'm saying to you that there's this trend from 1848 to the Second World War, which is this hunt, which we can discuss some more of in a minute. But at the same time, there's a counter hunt. So there's a different kind of flyer hunter. And then there's the other flyer hunter, <laughs> if you like. Yeah. <laughs> You know, Rudel's hunting T-34s and all the good tanks he destroys, but he isn't going to run around in a field because by his own words in his book, um, you know, he's the son of a pastor, a Lutheran pastor, and he doesn't, doesn't rate it very highly. And he thinks, you know, I turn up at Goering's headquarters and he's wearing a medieval hunting uniform. Well, you know, what's that all about? Because he doesn't understand it. Whereas Gallant will wander around being a hunter and think nothing of it because he was brought up on a hunting estate by, by, her, by his father, who was, I believe, a gamekeeper. And so it was, it was normal, normal for him. And then you start piecing them together because if, if Goering is in the hunter world and Richthofen's in the hunter world, and Gallant's in the hunter world, and Immelman's in the hunter world, and Raal is in the hunter world, you can start to piece together a social profile. But then you have to take into another consideration, which becomes excessively complicated. Um, and now is this now a good time for you to have a ask a question before I go even more detailed? <laughs> I, 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 I'm... I'm looking forward to the detailed bit, actually. <laughs> um, I, I think it's it's interesting there because you know the, the two groups that you, you're speaking about are the two sides of the Luftwaffe that you do see. You you know you you have the that Galland camp, and then you have you know Udat, who quite clearly didn't really like getting his hands dirty a lot of the time. So you can you can see why he wasn't wasn't a hunter. But you you it starts making what from the outside and from a cursory reading is this unified group actually starting to see the different sects within it that start pushing against each other as it goes on. And that's, I find that really fascinating. Well, you see what, what surprised me most of all was um, the hunter who took over the, 
the forest operations on behalf of Goering. At the, after the war, he wrote a story about what life was like in Goering's headquarters. And he wrote about Ernst Dudek being the most useless shot he'd ever seen. I found that really quite, quite surprising because if you look at the first book that was ever written about Richthofen, where his shooting is discussed, there is that constant link that turns up later and later in, in uh, German literature, which is the best fighter pilot is a hunter. Mm. Yeah? The finest fighter pilots are hunters. And when they shoot somebody down, they run off and cut a piece of tail off or whatever they do, right? Um, when Goering's biography is written in 1937, the first thing that's said about him is he can kill a stag with one shot. And that is the ability, of, that's a recognition of the fighter pilot because only a fighter pilot can do that in that quality and that capability and with that power. So to have Ernst Dudet being regarded as this most useless shot, when I believe he, he shot down, what, 70 aircraft or something? So, well, uh, I've, just, I've just Googled 62. 62 aircraft. I mean, he's a phenomenal pilot, yeah. never mind the shooting down. And what he reminds me of is, um, I can't remember the author's name, but there's a book called The Flyer. And I, mm, and yes, an, excellent book. Um, and there's another book about the flying nation which is about the German pilots and the German air technicians in the 20s and 30s. Uh, both, at the moment, have just left me. Martin Francis, the flyer. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, And then the other one, the, the, flying, the nation flying or the flying nation, where he talks about the German flying in the 20s and 30s. I think it's Hugo Junkers and all those people he talks about. I, vague memory now, it's a long time ago since I did that. But... In there, they're making a distinction that the flyer is a technocrat. He's the new man. He's modernity. Mm -hmm. And what I had to understand with the way they diminished Udet was that they were diminishing modernity. Now, when you diminish modernity, you're saying, what am I going to replace it with? But are you going to, are you going to replace it with antiquity? You're going to replace it with some kind of renaissance? I mean, what are you going to replace it with if, you're, if you don't want modernity? And, and what Goering did in the 30s was to rewrite the German hunt code, which never really existed, but there was a hunt code. Uh, I'm not talking about now the, the laws and regulations, but the, the hunt code of how people performed. And he got this hunter who would become the battalion commander in the Polish forest in the Second World War to write a book which was a, essentially an invent, a series of inventions of what never happened in German history. And he invented hunt ceremony, which never happened. So if you looked at Racefeld in 1914, he's saying, you kill the stag, you gut it, you go off and you have your drinks. Well, this guy, this, this chap, Fravert, comes along and says, no, we're not doing that. We're going to have a full ceremony and we're going to put leaves on the animal in various places like its mouth and its bowels. We're going to sit for an hour and contemplate its death. We're going to go for a whole ser a serious process here of engaging with this dead animal and remembering the past. And I'm thinking, well, that's pretty close to what the SS did, really, sitting in a, sitting in a cemetery, having sex with the new wife, uh, engaging with the dead and the past. And I'm thinking, well, you know, here's the, the, it's not the same as the SS, but it's not far different. And then when you start seeing how they're treating things like noble game and honouring the game, um, which leads to the creation of fantasy animals, you know, a chap called Heck creates these, they're trying to recreate aurochs. But in that breeding process, you see the relationship, the Nazi relationship to race and genetics and eugenics and how you're going to breed a new society. And we've always thought the Luftwaffe was never part of it. 
because we simply used to believe whatever Adolf Garland said or Gunter Rahn or any of these people. But those people never talked about the stuff that they were actually doing, which is this, which is looking at animals that, they're, that are being bred um, with Germanic qualities, which are going to be the future uh, animals of um, the future German forest. So already in the 1930s, you've got Hermann Goering creating um, a German hunt, which is not the German hunt. He's recreating it. And that's why I'm very definitely saying it's a Nazi hunt, because it breaks away from German traditions and German methods, which are very simplistic. And it, it, takes, it embraces all this ceremonial, um, this folkish ideology, this dogma of Nazism, and leads to, you know, ceremonies of people standing around Heil Hitlering and all of that stuff, which, you know, where did that come from? Because it was never there in 1914. And that led me to have to, to, to looking closely at Eric Hosbaum, who's a late um, British historian who worked on the idea of invention in history and invented history. And it struck me that Eric Hasbaum had the perfect models to comprehend what the German, what the Nazis were trying to do in the 1930s. And once that unlocked the scale of their ambition, then all the other bits fell into place. Because if you're going to create massive, great, big, uh, 16 hand size animals to roam around in a forest, you've got to have a lot of space. You can't, you, you can't do that in German forests because German forests have been humanized for one, mm -hmm. for a better word. And so you've got to push them east. So you need big forests. And if you're going to have big forests, then you're going to put them on your borders. And if you're going to put them on your borders as a blockade to, I don't know, Marxism or the Soviet horde or the Russian horde or the Mongol horde or whatever, you, whatever you're pushing that bulwark of forestry against, then you want an air force, which is not just an air force. It's an army, an air mobile army. And so what you see is while this, while the forest and the hunting story is being developed, you see on the other side that the Luftwaffe story is emerging. And the forest and the hunting is incubating the new Luftwaffe. So this, this technological arm that we would think of as, as being ultra modern is actually basing itself on made up ideals of the past yes fantasies when when i when i was re reading your book i kept saying to myself and this is this is no way trying to belittle anything that this is mental you would think with this yeah you know, completely new and very high tech for its time organization to be basing it on something like that is is very strange but when you bring that hunting element into it it starts making um i don't want to say make sense because i don't think anything the nazis did made a lot of sense but you know you, you know what I'm, I'm trying to get to there it's what you're saying is there's a rationale yes exactly um it's not and, altogether comprehensible by modern standards but there is a rationale Mm -hmm. which yes, exactly. appears to fit a logic, <laughs> however crazy that logic is. And, and I understand how you feel because when I first sat and looked at this and I thought to myself, hang on a minute. If, if Galland is right, that already they're talking about defeating the Soviet Union and creating an army out of the Luftwaffe, it not only means... They've shifted from 1934 when they kill Rome and the SR leadership and, and ended up with just the 
the, the Wehrmacht, to which the Luftwaffe may or may not have been part, and the SS, now you're saying the SS is there, but also the Luftwaffe is taking over the Wehrmacht. And that, that then raises another interesting thought, because if the ambition, and there was enough people saying this, if the ambition is to create a Nazi revolutionary army, I'm not sure it was revolutionary, but if there was this Nazi revolutionary army, it was actually to protect the greater German Reich, and therefore it was the kind of army that could fly over the forests, drop air landing troops, hit the opponent before the opponent has a chance to move, strafe them to pieces with, I don't know, JU-88s and dive bomb them with Stukas, effectively you're, you're doing blitzkrieg with aviation. Mm -hmm. And if they're thinking that in 1937 to be completed after 1941, then suddenly you get a strategic logic for why the Luftwaffe is behaving the way it is. And that's when I decided that this, this whole project, this whole project was turning into a metaphor, not just for the hunting and for Goering's honor codes and the ambitions of the Nazi state, but it was also a metaphor for what the Luftwaffe was going to become. Yeah. And if that's what it was going to become, what we're actually seeing is what they thought the Luftwaffe should be doing. Yeah, That changes the complexion completely differently because you think, hang on a minute, they're doing what they're doing because they're under pressure, there's war and all the rest of it. But are they doing it because actually that's their now standard operating procedure for what they want to get to at the end? That's a very different story. And that, that creates a huge pressure on your thinking process because you're going through so many different thoughts. If they're going to have, they're going to have air landing, how have they used their air landing? Well, they've dropped paratroopers, they've got air, air landing troops coming in. Well, how quickly was that sorted? Well, hang on, they did that in five years. <laughs> yeah, okay. There's some radical thinking going on here. So what you're saying is, there's there's Heinz Guderian and all of those boys doing that blitzkrieg thing down there, and then you've got Galland and Goering and the other boys over there thinking completely differently, and both are odds with each other. And the only time they work together is when they're doing an invasion, and then they go off and do, do their things. And then I started to see that there were those moments when that happened, when they did go separate ways. One of them, of course, is creep. Another one is what went on in Norway. Um, so, yeah. yeah. I think one of the notes you sent me when we were chatting about this that it had never twigged in my mind was you said that, you know, 1943, upwards of 5 million men, women, and children were mobilized in the Luftwaffe. Yeah. I've, that's, I'd never considered that the Luftwaffe as, a, as an organization being that big. Yeah. <laughs> you, you, you're, you're looking at me like, I, I should know. That has never crossed my, in all the years of reading about them and stuff, they, they, they always, they, they've always come across in, in a lot of the histories I've read as the, the June, the, almost the junior arm in, in, in the great scheme of things. But they're not. They are a huge, as we're going to get into, a huge organisation with their fingers in so many pies you wouldn't think of. Well, because well, another thing that people don't understand about the Luftwaffe is that it's got all these industries built into it. And also it's sharing, it's sharing resources with the SS. So when Goering needs... I mean, this is the crazy thing with the, with the with all these stories about the SS killing uh, skilled labour. They still managed to find skilled labour in the concentration camps to pass to the Luftwaffe, even as late as 43, 44, to work on the on the precision engineering works for the 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 main aircraft, the 109s, the 88s, and what have you. And you think, well, hang on, 
Over there, they're killing them, but over here, they're giving them to the Luftwaffe. So there's a different rule for the Luftwaffe than there is for everybody else. I was in mental again, because that's the only thing I can think of. It's... it's... Well, it, 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 it does. It, do, it doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't make sense. But then it. it, it <laughs> what, what does? It, what, one of the prime reasons why it doesn't make sense is because what we're dealing with is the reconstruction of records from incomplete archives. Hmm. So, okay, I know how detailed the evidence strands are and threads in the book because they were checked, double-checked, and then analysed through um, scientific methods. But if somebody said to me, oh, it's not true that the Fallschirmjäger were being set up for becoming a, an army on its own, I would say I disagree because of the conversation which Ranka had with Goering in 1944, before Normandy, about who is going to control the paratroopers in the future. And Goering is telling him then, even then, it's always been my way, ever since the back days of when I was a student in the under Schlieffen and all of that, that we were going to have a revolutionary army like the French. Well, okay, the levy en masse and all of that is one story, but he's talking about something where aviation and military operations are something uh, are like light years ahead of what goes on in Vietnam and what goes on in the Gulf War. And you would think that all of those people who've studied American military aviation, who've also looked into the Luftwaffe as you know the precursors to their their their, their story in their story, you would have thought they'd have picked up on it. But they didn't. Nobody had. So the Luftwaffe is this, what is it? A couple of hundred thousand fighter pilots and bomber pilots. And then there's this land operation of ground troops. And then there's the Fallschirmjäger. Then there's a few flak troops. Then they move the flak troops out and they take all the hit the youth in and make them man the guns. And the story just gets watered down without anybody really asking the question. Go back to 35. What is this Luftwaffe meant to be? That's a hard story to work out. And I think I've got some of it, maybe a lot of it, but there's still things that need to still be looked at. So, yeah, understanding what that intention is makes what follows um, more understandable because you can see what the, the, the goal was as opposed to what the outcome was. Yeah, I mean, it, here, here's one thing. There's a huge debate among scholars and um, interest in aviation that the Germans didn't produce a four-engine bomber. Right? Everyone goes crazy about that discussion. And Well, it should be a Henkel 177 with four engines and all that mm -hmm. stuff. If you're creating a, a land-based armed force, which is air mobile, why would you need a four-engine bomber? Because you're fighting a different world then, aren't you? Yeah. And if Britain wants to be on its island, okay, fine. There's the channel. Britain isn't going to do anything on its own. Can't come unless the Americans get involved. And if already Russia's out of the game, if that's how you're thinking, I'm saying, Russia's out of the game. It's just Britain on its island. You dominate Europe. Why do you need a four-engine bomber? Apart from if you want to bomb more and more of London and Manchester. Well, okay, fine. But that's not going to be your thinking in 1935, is it? If your ambition is to have Lebensraum in the East and you want to set up an empire, you have an armed force or a mobile force like the British have in the British colonies. And who keeps going on about the British and the colonists? Hitler. Yeah. Now that does make a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah. I've always thought that. I've always thought they're building, they're not building the force that the West think they are building or trying to build because they're not thinking the way the West think. 
and you know, and and you can you can if you sort of switch it around, the aircraft that say the British were building in the late thirties were never you know beyond say the Spitfire and the Hurricane and the Battle of Britain. None of it was used for the war it was designed for. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I I don't want to mention the T word um, and start going on about typhoons again and about how the better bomber, bomber, bomber destroyer becomes a fighter bomber. But it's it's I guess it's that switch of hang on, we're not fighting that war. We need to change as opposed to this is what we want to achieve. And you stick to that as you're working your way through it. I think the biggest shock for the Luftwaffe was the Mosquito. And if you give me two minutes, I'll explain why. Go for it. Mosquito is always welcome on the show. In 1923, Goering convinced Hitler that forestry would be the new resource of the future and that you would be able to make oil from forestry and you would be able to make aeroplanes from forestry and you may be able to do all sorts of things from forestry. And... You may or may not be aware, but there was all these uh, substitute forms of material being produced by Goering's manufacturers. So a lot of the uniforms, if you look at Luftwaffe uniforms, they've got rayon in them, which is this artificial substi material substitute, which some say held together well and some say didn't. But forestry was going to be the future. And the biggest investment outside of the direct military in industry was in forestry. And one of the reasons why Goering was very, very unpopular was in January 1943, mosquitoes hit speech places in Berlin and Rostock. Rostock, I think, was where Goebbels was giving a speech. Goering was giving the end of Stalingrad speech and the People's War speech uh, in Berlin. And mosquitoes came in and he was heard to say the alarm was going off and, you know, run for the bunkers and what have you. Now, the fallout of that was when a mosquito was shot down, they discovered it was made of wood. And the shock to the system the whole military system was huge because all of this investment had gone into wood and they hadn't produced anything. They hadn't, okay, they'd got the rayon and they'd got some substitute materials and they created sugar and one or two other items. Um, but they hadn't achieved what de Havilland had achieved. That was a shock. And that's when it started to, you know, come in on them, that their, their ambitions, their plans were all falling apart. But that idea of forestry went right the way back to 1923. And that's why Goering is in charge of forestry, which a lot of people forget about. Yeah? I'm, 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 my, now that you've mentioned that, and having just read your book, which is all about the Lefort in, in a forest, the speech raids have always been the ones that I've I've enjoyed reading about because it's the ultimate, you know, thumbing of a nose to to an opponent. But when you put start putting those elements together, and as we're going to start chatting about the the forest and German psyche, going back even further, that wasn't just you know embarrassing as you said it was it was shaking to the core the the belief that the that they'd been working on within the Lefofa from from day one well I could, before well, day, day one yeah but what i don't understand about the royal air force and you know they're not perfect in all of this because yeah that was a great raid but if you go back to 1940 I can't remember what it is, WA2 or something, the bombing code rules and what have you. Mm -hmm. WA40, is it? The, yeah, the, the ones the where you're not allowed bombing. to go anywhere near people. And, yeah, all of that. Yeah. But So they come up with this ridiculous plan to bomb German forests. And the idea is they know that Goering 
has got ambitions for the forests economically, but they also think that the forests have got some spiritual impact on Nazi thinking. And they picked that up from Goering. They've not got it from anywhere else. They've got it from Goering. And it comes from the times when you know, people like the RAF and, and Henderson and Halifax have met Goering and they've heard about the forest. And Goering's incredible offer, you know, if I give you five stags, can we have Poland or Czechoslovakia or whatever the agreement mm. was? Well, that was when it, sort of Hen Henderson was completely taken in, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah but he was a Lulu. I mean, you know, <laughs> he's another one of these running around with a gun, you know, being a hunter and everybody's socially equal. I, you know, I put him in the book because he was actually saying in English what people thought about the hunt and how it, and it showed how how the idea of the hunt could trans transfer, you know, transfer across countries, mm -hmm. societies. Um, yeah, it, <laughs> he was. Uh, yeah, I had a problem with him. <laughs> <laughs> but going back to Royal Air Force with the bombing. You know, they know what the they knew what the issue was, so they they started to drop bombs. I mean, here in Arkham in 1940, they bombed the forest. And everyone's saying, "What are the British doing? What are they doing? It's a forest." <laughs> <laughs> and you know, well, they're bombing the forest. <laughs> Why are they bombing the forest? <laughs> what do they know that we don't know? You know, I mean, that, that's the Royal Air Force for you. So when they come and do something which has an impact, like the mosquitoes, they miss what they've done. Mm -hmm. Yeah? They think what they've done is to have a propaganda hit on Goering. What they haven't realised is not only has Goering been unable to support Stalingrad's relief, which, which actually nobody really blamed him for, as far as I can see, that was all much later when they used Stalingrad as an issue. Um, what they blamed him for was he had people like Lurzer and, and some of these old fogies from the Great War still around him, telling him to fight a war which they were no longer fighting. And Hitler got fed up with them, especially those like Ulrich Scherping who continued to go on hunting trips and having massive feasts and all the rest of it when the country was in rations. But what they were totally upset with was the fact that the forestry thing had been shown to have failed, that the British had done it better. The problem is he couldn't have done what the, the Havilland produced because he didn't have the glues coming from, you know, the balsa coming from mm. the colonies and what have you. You know, and, and the mosquito in, any, in, in every sense is some kind of empire aeroplane, isn't it? Yeah, it's Very constructed nice, yeah. from empire. It, 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 all the goodies come from empire. If you don't have the empire, you certainly can't build that from a, you know, an airfix kit in <laughs> in Britain because we haven't got the gear. So you can't, you can't you can't make a mos mosquito out of elm. No. So, they, so you know you've got that Canadian pine. You've got the balsa coming from the south, and they're coming in. I mean, for me, I know they're coming where they're coming into. They're coming into Manchester on Manchester liners. And then they're being shipped from Manchester Dock straight to de Havilland. So you know the routes, you know the stuff, you know how it's coming in, and you think, yeah, great. The Germans can't do that. They haven't got the they haven't got the raw materials. They haven't got the the good stuff to build that kind of airplane. So they're always going to be stuck. And of course, you know, Hugo Junkers has, has left had left such a, a stamp on aviation thinking in certain quarters. They couldn't get out of that either. So that was like, you know, we have to do it that way because he did it that way. So, okay, fair enough. And and it and it comes back and again it comes back to the forest. They they have this obsession with it, but it doesn't give them doesn't give them what what, what they need. Um, well, it's going again in the 30s. He sends out um, some leading forestry scientists. He gives them commissions in the Luftwaffe and sends them off to the Amazon to learn about 
deep wilderness, what they call Urwald, which is, you know, primeval forest. They then come back and start writing these books about what the forest should be. So the forest in Poland are declared by this guy to be impenetrable, which, I, which is funny, really, because the German army marched through it in 1941. And you think, well, if Hermann Geyer and the Ninth Corps of the German army, with all those tanks and troops and God knows what else, could march through there, it can't really be that impenetrable, <laughs> <laughs> can it? So you, you sort of look, well, hang on a minute, how is this impenetrable? What are they going to do? And, even and then if, they think it's impenetrable again in 1944, but we're going to come back to that. No, well, no, that's right. <laughs> but, but while it's being invaded by the German army in 41, the dude who thinks it's impenetrable is going to write a book or series of pamphlets which goes round to all the German army officers saying these forests are impenetrable. Now imagine what that does to your thinking. You're a general and you've got a load of panzer divisions and what have you coming along and you're trying to deploy them. You immediately say, well, I'm not going in that forest because it's impenetrable because the dude has told me. Mm. But the Soviets, they say, well, <laughs> where have all the Germans come? <laughs> <laughs> which, which you know is a hoot and you're thinking there's something really strong strange going on with these Germans that, that, that it's like they're creating a philosophy and then believing it so not testing it there's no let's see if this works kind of thing it's we know this works because we've got faith in the Fuhrer and Goering and all the rest of it. And they've said this is going to happen. So, yeah, it's going to happen. And then when it doesn't, they all look at each other like, well, okay, <laughs> now what are we going to do? They, they, write the, <laughs> they write the fairy tale and then they go all in on it. Fairy tale. Wish I'd used it in the book. But you, can, you can have that one for free for the next one. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> You're so kind, Matt. You know, I'm, I'm here to help, Phil. Um, let, let, let's let's dig into this primeval forest idea a little bit because you know we we're sort of laughing a little bit about this idea of an impenetrable wilderness that the Germans get through in was it a week, and then they start doubling down on it. But for for you and your work, let's talk about the um, the, dish, the GIS mapping of it. To understand what went on in it, you kind of have to understand where everything is. And whereas it may not be impenetrable in being able to get through it, being able to understand what goes on in it, you found to be very difficult to start with, didn't you? Well, the, first, the, the, the biggest problem was that the German soldiers wrote their reports with references to a map. And the map didn't have any references on it. So you couldn't understand how the report worked in the map. Because the maps that the, the Bundesarchiv were keeping were sterilized of all references and numerics and what have you. So we technically had to rebuild the maps through Polish maps that had been produced in the 20s and 30s by the Polish Forestry Administration. And once you digitized the German map back into the Polish maps, we could then work out by plotting the various positions of the German unit. So you, you, could, you could work out where the battalion headquarters were, you could work out where the companies were, you could work out where the the ghettos were, the prison camps, um, right the way down to the killing sites of individuals, either German soldiers being killed or killing victims. Um, and of course, we could do the full layout of how an operation would take place uh, when a Yag commando conducted itself in, in a tactical exercise. So we had to first get that map, and I would say that was the hardest job. And it took my partner, who's a geographical information system scientist, an awful long time 
of recreating a digital map out of um, the evidence we had. Now, let me just dial back once one brief moment here. I'd almost given up on this project because in 2010, I wrote an article for the Holocaust and Genocide Studies and I pretty much said to Richard Holmes uh, at that stage, we can't unlock this. We physically cannot unlock this because we don't have the references. The maps have not survived with references, so we don't know how to link everything up. Can I, so, can I just ask, where, where did the references get removed? Do we, do we know that? No. All we've got is a blank map with the edges cut round. It's almost like we don't want to see anything. So literally just sort of yeah. trim, trimmed off the edge bits would have got the... Yes. And wow. what, we can't, we can't, what we can't tell is when it was created originally, whether that map was on a large table in the forest administration headquarters and that they would step down and look down on the table from a height, like a, a, an aviation map where they, where they trained on a galley to go over a, yep. a, a, a large map area to understand how terrain works. Because if you look at the map, you would have to lie across on your belly to get to the middle of it to mark things on it. I mean, I mean it's, this thing is huge. The other thing is, when the Germans created the area, what I call the arena of operations, it's actually three parts of different states. So you've got the, the original uh, Polish forest of Biowice up to the northeast, uh, to the northwest. You've got the swamplands of Belarus, and then you've got verging onto the edge of the Ukraine. And it's in this kind of crown point of three territories that the Germans have taken maps together and tried to piece them together to say this is the new Lebensraum. So if you're living there and you're in there all the time and you know where all these places are and you've got a unit in that town, that town and that town, it's easy for you to say, right, okay, well, I know where X is and I know where Y is and I know where Z is. So you don't need too many references. You just need what the local grid references that you're using for standard security operations. Well, would you keep that? Probably not. You'd keep the combat reports and the after combat reports, and maybe you, in this case they kept one map. But all the working papers, which were then practical at the time, they probably just got binned. You know, why would you keep them? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot to discover. And so what we did was to recreate the whole scene. And that is by creating a digital map, then the layers of information, which essentially are the combat reports, the terrain reports, the outside reports, the results reports, the individual studies from personnel files. You know, if you've got an individual who said he went here, there and everywhere, and you could work out where he'd been and what he'd done, you could plot that all into the story. Um, um yeah. Sorry, go on. How, how many layers did the map have in the end? Um, As someone who's used pin, pinpoint in a, in a previous life. <laughs> <laughs> um, some maps had as many as 35 layers. Wow. Um, one map with all the little um, combat operations which I pulled because it was too complex. You mm. couldn't, I can see it on a screen, I can manipulate it and look at it. But reading it in a book, it would just look like a spirograph, if you remember spirographs. Mm. And I thought, mm, it says a lot. It shows all the activity. It shows a wealth of activity. I mean, they must have been running somewhere in the region of 30 or 40 um, patrols per day. Uh, and the way they covered space was not by going out and coming back. It was going from one point to the next point. That's why you needed to understand the map, how the map worked and where the places were so that you could re-put the unit back into its place and say, okay, he's going from 
A Company to headquarters battalion, or he's going to A Company sec that strong point to strong point X over there, and they'll march anything up to 35 kilometers. And if they stopped at night, they would stop at night, create a little camp, do their thing, and then move on next morning. I mean, the great, the, the one thing you know about the Germans, and I've, and I understand why they do do this. They don't patrol at night because in that forest, it's black. You know, I, I've, I've been there at night. You step out a few yards, and you're in total blackness. There's no way you could find anything. And I guess, and, and that also brings in yeah, out, out in the darks where the bogeyman lives, isn't it? When you uh, when you're on a patrol, you're you're sort of cut off, and you know, as we're going to get onto the the bandit hunting and things later on, it's um it's scary out there. It it's it in the summertime, it's incredibly oppressive. So you it it's like this intense heat which you think in a forest you wouldn't be getting um, with thousands and thousands of bugs. I've never seen so many bugs in all my life. I, I, <laughs> we turned the light on and I know I just, wow, the, the room was just full of bugs. I thought, Christ, this is staggering. <laughs> and, and then in the cold, wow, is it cold? I don't think I've been that cold for a long time. And, and in the snow and the ice, it is truly uncomfortable. Um, so, I, yeah, um, just on terrain conditions alone, it's not good. And the other thing which you don't see is there is, we, we mapped it in 3D, and you can't put it in a book, but we mapped it digitally in 3D and then started to spin it so you could, so you could look at how the terrain was... Um, was changing. And one of the biggest terrain change factors was, believe it or not, rain. The rain would cause gullies and plateaus because it would cut through the soft soil between the trees and literally push the soil up like a heap, like a small plateau or a small hillock, and then divert. And then, of course, if it rained in another way and and for example, if it caught in another side, another gully would cut across. So we went to where one German soldier was killed, and I went to it three different times. And the place where he was killed, the terrain had changed three different times over a seven-year period. That's incredible. And so you can't say that that's what the terrain was like, but you understand certain things. What, that, what the terrain told me by studying it was why people got the injuries and the and the wounds that they did in certain places. So I know he was cresting a plateau when he was shot in the throat. Yeah, yeah, because that would be the first the first thing someone that was scanning that with a rifle would see would be sort of yeah, sh sh yeah, head and shoulders, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Mm. And the and the thing about the partisans um, is they're not idiots. Not at all. Um, but you wonder who they are, because they say they're Russians, um, but I wonder whether sometimes they're, they're, they're Poles. But you can't tell. It's very, very difficult to tell. Um, most of the time, the Germans are killing them as soon as they capture them. So you don't, you get an idea, but... Well, let's, let's get on to that. Because you know this this term, which I'm about to butcher in my best schoolboy German, which is Bandbekämpfung. Very good. Is it all right? Oh, super. Um, what is it? <laughs> right, we're back to hunting again. We, we well, I, I don't think we're going to get very far from hunting in any part of this conversation, are we? No. Bandit hunting uh, stems from the days when foresters and hunters hunted bandits. And believe it or not, banditry was rife throughout the period 
1400s right the way through, you've still got bandits roaming the eastern German forests, not the Polish forests, the eastern German forests in East Prussia and, and Silesia into and up to during the uh, First World War and roving bands of Freikorps and other um, lost bands marching through the eastern forests, acting as bandits in the 20s and 30s. So you've got, you've got a, a, um, a methodology which is to counter banditry. And everybody knows it. It means hunt bandits. Now, when you come to the Franco-Prussian War, you're looking for it, but you can't see the word being used very much. But come the colonial wars, um, 1904 especially, when you've the war against Herrero, you will see in Namibia they're using Bandon Bekenfum. And in particular, Ritter von Epp, um, a famous German soldier in the First World War, later became a financier and big supporter of Hitler. Um, he was involved in the China expedition in 1900, and he conducted Bandon Bekenfung operations in China. He then, he then was one of the lead officers at the Wartburg in August, well, this month, or 1904, when they destroyed the Herrera and they encircled them, which is the standard form of operation, like a Kasselschlacht, but an encirclement operation. Um, my impression is, and I tend to believe it with the German, with my German colleague, uh, Jürgen Zimmer and, and other friends, there was a deliberate attempt to leave one part of the encirclement open so that the Herrera tribesmen would flee into the, I think it's the Akami Desert, I can't remember the name now, and to die by natural wastage. It's a very natural thing in German thinking to use terrain to kill your opponent. So if they starve to death, um, suffer from heat exhaustion, die from lack of thirst and what have you, that is normal. That's standard operating procedure. Use that time after time after time uh, throughout the history. Mm -hmm. Use it in the Franco-Prussian War and before, Napoleonic War. So, um, Banda Bekanfung, having gone to the colonies, comes back to Germany with Ritter von Epp in 1919. There's something called the Rata Republic, the Red Republic in Munich. The Freikorps and the right-wing military units, paramilitary units, suppress the Red Republic in Munich in a particularly vicious way. And they use the Warteburg encirclement method uh, against Munich. They, they pacify the whole thing. They destroy them. Um, many hunters involved take great pride in killing communists like vermin. vermin. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's Bandon Bekenfer. So you've had the Warteburg, you've had Munich, and then later in 1944, you'll have Warsaw. So the big battles of Bandon Bekenfer as a military um, process uh, is, is imagined in the German mindset. We fight this way in combat against guerrilla armies, resistance armies, and, and what have you. Um, what actually happens then is during the 20s and 30s, obviously, there's all kinds of uh, paramilitary violence taking place um, here in my part of the world in Rhinelander. Uh, a young lieutenant who's the son of the Belgian commander of the occupation forces here in Narken um, was shot dead on a tram, I think, in Dusseldorf or Dortmund. I can't remember where. It sparks an out uprising. Um, the French want to mobilise forces. What you see happening is the Germans fighting the Belgians as bandon, bandits. But they are in fact bandits themselves. <laughs> They're bandits themselves acting as bandits. Yeah. And the same is Sherping, a guy called Ulrich Sherping, who becomes the godfather of the German hunt. 
He's in the Freikorps out in the Baltic, and he's committing Bandung Bekämpfung operations against communists. So there's all of this activity going on in the 20s, early 20s, up to about 1925. Um, then it kind of settles away uh, because you've had the mandates post Versailles, you've had all the troubles. There is a period when everybody goes quiet. Then, of course, we have the Great Crash and the mayhem, and people have got other things to worry about, like mass starvation and unemployment. Cities like Arkham, where there's 60% unemployed literally overnight, and factories closing, and chaos. So, um, Hitler comes along, and the next big conflict is the Spanish Civil War. And the Luftwaffe senior pilots like Adolf Galland and all that go off to fight against Bolshevism. Now, that little, you know, that little mo that little point in their history is conveniently wiped. If you pick up Galland's book, um, what is it, The Few or something? The, um, the first the of last, the, first the last of the the last of the liars. He he's uh, <laughs> 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 he comes up with this, you know, with this mass, with this great book, missing out the one thing that made him, which is the Spanish Civil War, which was a war against Bolshevism. Mm -hmm. You know, if you look at the medals, it's the war against Bolshevism. And What's you, very interesting in all of this. And Stein Steinhelfer wrote that he wouldn't shout out about the Spanish Civil War in, in 1940 either. There you go. But he, but he leaves that bit out. Well, we, we digress. <laughs> But what's interesting, what people don't pick up on the Spanish Civil War is that there's certain people there who are going to be very, very important. And one of them is a guy called Oscar de la Vanga. And Oscar de la Vanga is on the ground forces working with signals and armoured units and flat units. And he's recovering his reputation having been threatened with prison for child molestation and he's already got a fantastic first world war record but because of what happened in the 30s while he was a nazi he's lost his position and he's had to refine his status by going to spain the bomber commander is a guy called richtofen who we know is related to you know who from the first world war and there's also molders and there is gallant so you've got these important players. Now, behind that scene, you've got a guy called Walter Valamont, who he had a funny name, something like Gypsy or Jeremy or something. Yeah. But he, he had a spy name. But the point is that Valamont was watching the way the operations were being conducted as an army operations officer. So you've got Valamont, you've got the boys on the ground, Plus, you then got Goering. Now, Goering is actually running hunting events back in Germany with senior members of the German armed forces discussing strategy. And they're doing strategy there and then. And they're allowing people like the Polish ambassador to take part, which I still find crazy. But there anyway. <laughs> <That's insane>. Yeah. <laughs> right. So... So you've got all these people who you're going to fight soon, adding their input into these activities in Spain. Anyway, we're digressing a bit. So the fact of the matter is they were fighting what they believe were rebel forces, communist forces, terrorist forces, and they were using standard military methods, which is to bomb Guernica and to send out the tanks and then ground strafing and everything else. And yeah, they learn a lot of stuff, but it's not the learning of stuff that's important to me. It's the fact that they're there for a, a crusading mission. The crusading mission is national socialism against Bolshevism. So you've now got two organizations emerging in, in the late thirties. One is the SS who call themselves an anti-Bolshevik organization. And you've got the Luftwaffe who are fighting as an anti-Bolshevik organization. So you've got these two running in a parallel. And I think actually um, 
you could say there's competition, but there's also massive cooperation between the two because they are the two Nazi organizations. So for the moment, let's just leave the army aside because the army is that other thing. But the two national socialist organizations, one is the SS and one is the Luftwaffe, and you've got Goering and Himmler, and they're pretty much close. They've already murdered between them Ernst Röhm and the SR leadership. Um, again, behaving like Bandon, but calling their opponents Bandon. Um, the following year from the Rome moment, uh, Himmler presents Goering with a trophy, a hunting trophy at a hunting event to say, well done, what a good job we did on the 30th of June killing Rome. So already they're all playing the hunter thing. Himmler, by the way, is a huge hunter. Spends all his time, if he can, hunting. And all of his people, like Carl Wolf, are all hunters. So you've got the SS coming along, nicely developing their own thing. Um, the Luftwaffe are developing their thing. You come to 1941, which is this critical period when, when they go to war against Russia. I'm going to skip a few weeks. Um, because there's been a lot going on. They've had anti-partisan conferences. Baksalevsky, the SS leader, has been doing stuff in the forest where you, you were looking at where they were killing Jews and communities and all the rest of it. But the thing for me is the death of Molders. Because Udet is killed, uh, sorry, commits suicide. Molders is killed on the way. <laughs> some, 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 some people will say he was killed. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> but that's that that's that's definitely a down the pub sort of conversation was yeah okay was it murdered I, I, or did I, I can take it? that i mean yeah i can take that because i think well you know uh, yeah I, either which way he was going to end up dead i i don't think udet's a nice guy that everybody wants to paint him yeah no to me anybody who comes up with the stuka and the ju88 has got some issue going on because he was a fighter pilot yeah? yeah and now what we're doing I'll tell you what we're doing. We're creating this kind of style of warfare, which is exceedingly unpleasant, and it's targeted against civilians as much as it's targeted against soldiers. So, you know, Udet being a nice guy? No. Oh, no. <laughs> so, but the fact as, is... As the last chapter of his autobiography proves, which is just praising Hitler in, you know, 500 words. So, Goering... So, Goering's on the point of... Um, court-martialing Udet for committing suicide when Mulders is killed. And Garland gets into a position. But the interesting, the reason why I'm raising this is at the time that Garland is promoted, um, and the first part of the story of my book is Garland's on a hunt in the East, in a forest in Lithuania. But the point of that point is at the time he's doing that hunt, he's in the same forest where 10,000 Jews have been slaughtered. Now, <laughs> what's the message? The message he says in his forestry, in the hunting article in 1942, is you can't hunt in forests in the east because you'll meet partisans because he met three partisans, he shot one and the others ran off and all the rest of it. But the point of the, the, the actual underlying point of the story is there's something going on in the forest and you don't want to go there because it's unpleasant. And that story to me was, a, was kind of a light switch moment saying what's happening in the Polish forest with the, with the, Luftwaffe ground troops that we're going to discuss in a minute. Um, that wasn't exceptional. It's already happened. We've already had Luftwaffe troops in a forest nearby mass murder. And that there is some engagement. Whether it's we know what's going on and we're going to ignore it. Or we're going to send out a public warning that you avoid these places because there's something worse going on than you can ever imagine. Whatever that story was, it was there and it was live. And just to give you an idea how many hunters we are, in Germany in 1941, there were 275,000 hunters. 
Now, bearing in mind there were 320,000 policemen, we can see how much hunting is very much an important part of society. He's talking to a huge base when he writes that article. And I don't believe it was propaganda. I think that was a proper statement of don't go east because there's something unpleasant out there. Now, in that tale, Galland kills a roebuck and on his search for the roebuck comes up against three partisans. Like I said, he shoots one in the chest and then he backs off. And then, regretting the loss of his roebuck, goes back to look for it, finds it, and then complains it was the greatest hunting moment of his life. Mm. All of that story never got into his memoirs. Until I saw that story um, when was it? It was 2008. Until I saw that story, I had no idea of the extent to which Garland was a focused hunter, i.e. he wanted to go into a place and be a Germanic hunter in an alien forest, fighting as a jerk. And, and he makes it very clear he wanted to hunt on his own, so his adjutant went one way and he went the other. That's very, very German hunting style I'm talking about now. Mm -hmm. So he's telling us, I am the ideal German hunter. I'm also the top fighter pilot. I fought these three partisans. I killed the roebuck, and I'm telling you, don't go into the forest. Do you see the do you see the gameplay? It's it's sort of saying I've I've just about gotten out of this. You won't you you won't because you're not me. Yeah. Yeah. And even if you do go there, you're not gonna like what you see because there might be something ugly. Yeah. There, there there'd be dragons, basically. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he talks about the detritus on the ground, the trenches, the destruction of war. Really? Hmm think so maybe or is it the grave pits of 10,000 Jews I think I think I think there's a story there yeah so having explained Galland it's then very easy to explain Walter Freyvert because when Walter Freyvert becomes Goering's personal hunter He's creating the rules that Garland is going to abide by. Yeah? Mm -hmm. You see the roundabout? I know it's a roundabout way of doing things. But I've taken Garland's story and I've looked at somebody else's story to explain Garland's story. <laughs> because if you don't, you can't understand Garland's story on its own. The, 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 the detail, without having first understood what he's doing and why he's doing it, would not be obvious to you without reading Freyvert's book of 1937, which is this, as I say, this in invention of German hunting. And, and that Nazi hunt is what Galland is expressing in that article. And that's why I opened with it in the book, because it's basically saying to you, you're dealing with a Nazi here. This is no, this is no ordinary Luftwaffe pilot. This is a real hardcore Nazi. I've, I've, I've just, I've just looked it up because there, there's the bit that I've, I've got highlighted mine because he's, he, he also takes a swipe at, at Bolshevism, doesn't he? Because he calls it, you know, the, you, you said it's the, the shortcoming of hunting's in the paradise of farmers and workers. Yeah, he's, he's demeaning. He's sort of scaring people away and demeaning it all at the same time. Yeah. Which is a, which is was, a very... And what was he doing in 1937 in Spain? Exactly the same thing. So it's no different. We've just gone through the same process. We've discovered by peeling away the onion, as Gunter Grass would say, we've come to the point where we know who these people are because we've exposed who they are by their personal actions. Uh, yeah, that's utterly fascinating. Because 
it it tells you a lot about Gallen because if if you've if you've only read his autobiography, which is a thrilling work of fiction, let's you know let's be let's be fair, yeah. Last of the liars. Yeah, it's yeah, it, it's completely fabricated. Um, well, it's not. It's very specifically designed. But when you look at look at it, you know, and reading the opening bit that you you've you've got in your book, you get an insight onto who the man was. And the culture with wit with win it within which he was operating. And I think for yeah, you know, for the, the bits we're going to talk about next, I think it's vital to get that mindset. Well, because I think it, it, thing, it doesn't make sense otherwise. Right. Well the 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 thing with the thing that you're dealing with with somebody like Galland is he's telling you all the way through the book everything that I've just told you. But you don't read it because that's not what you're looking for. Because when he wrote the book, he was writing the book about being a fighter pilot, flying around up in the skies, being the knights of the sky and all that touch. What you didn't read was his headquarters was in the Elkveld. And the Elkveld was the Kaiser Wilhelm II's Elk Estate in East Prussia, mm. which is very close to Reminton, where Goering had Hemihall. So all these forestry estates, which have hunting lodges, become headquarters. Now, who on earth would want to be in the Elkveld running Luftwaffe headquarters. How far away can you be from reality? And what saves him is that the Luftwaffe signal system is so advanced that they have these special huge antennas which can send their signals out far and wide with relays along the way on the system. So actually, yes, he can be in the outfield running fighter operations. But in reality, if you were really thinking about being a fighter pilot or a fighter controller general, would you really put yourself in an East Prussian forest in a hunting lodge, even 100 kilometers from the center of Königsberg? I mean, you wouldn't, would you? Why? Uh, Why? I, I mean, you're close to the Baltic. Well, you would if you want to hunt elk all day and do other equally dull stuff. So, yeah, that's what happens. And, 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 you, and you think, hang on, well, no, they're not all like that. So you go and have a look at Hitler's headquarters. And where do they put Hitler's headquarters? <laughs> they always put him in a forest where there's hunting. So all his liaison officers can go hunting. And Hitler, who's a vegetarian and who clearly hates hunting and went on a boar hunt in the First World War, hated every minute of it and despised it to, you know, it was the end for him. They put him in headquarters. I mean, they actually locate the Führer in headquarters where there's hunting. <laughs> <laughs> and you're thinking, yeah, wow. What a gang of heroes these people are. And then you have conversations. If you look at Hitler's tabletop, I mean, okay, some of those conversations are pretty rubbish. But if you look at some of the several in there where Hitler actually takes the Michael out of Hunters. I mean, he, he, he's laughing at, at uh, Karl Wolf and um, the Italian, I've forgotten his name for a minute. They go hunting together to shoot rabbits and, and, and Hitler's making jokes like, so you used explosive shells, did you? <laughs> and you, you think that's Hitler. That's Hitler telling jokes at lunch about hunters. And he's surrounded by hunters. And he's surrounded by hunters and they're all justifying why they like hunting to it, which again reinforces the story that I know because I've looked back at how the hunting mind mindset is working within the German professional elites. And it's the same conversation. 
It doesn't matter how they phrase it. You know, well, I was in an Albanian mountain or I was up in the Bosnian forest or I was down in the cast in, in Italy or Yugoslavia or somewhere. It's the same hunting logic. I mean, Eugen Meindl, the Fallschirmjäger, who's in Crete, in Crete um, during military opera- after the military operations, goes mountain goat hunting because he knows that's where the place is. So he goes and gets decent food by hunting mountain goats. And you're thinking, yeah, cool. That's what I like to see. Hunters showing their true expertise, supplying their troops with food. <laughs> Oh, dear. I hate to be flippant, but there's a point when all of this becomes, you know, you have to think, well, wow. I, I, I just... Fr- nutty as fruitcakes, these people. I, so, I kind of want to go back and read Gallon's book, but looking at it with him as hunter as opposed to fighter pilot and just seeing how, uh, it, how, it, how it reads. Because oh, I've literally just turned down a first thing. <laughs> first edition English copy of it because I thought, well, there's no point having that, but I'm, I'm tempted to go back to the lady to say she still has it now. Well, the lad constable, you remember him who did uh, those aviation books in the late mm. 60s, early 70s? Yeah. I think he did a really good book. I remember my friend telling me on Hartman. Um, I think I bought it for him for his birthday. Um, but constable wrote a book called Horid- Horido. Well, that's the term for shooting somebody or an animal. Hmm. Okay. So I open up the horrido and I start going through Constable's book and I'm thinking, hang on a minute, why are we having this conversation about St. Hubertus? Well, St. Hubertus is the patron saint of hunting. And the Luftwaffe and the foresters and the hunters have to recognise in November every year Hubertus Day. Well, lo and behold, you read Gunter Rahl's book or any of these others, and they always mention, oh, it was a Hubertus time, you know, Hubertus day, celebrating the hunt. So yeah, yeah, after a while, you're sat there thinking, yeah, got you. Yeah, yeah, another one. Yeah, okay, spotted you. Yeah, I got that one. Thank you very much. And it's like a code. They're sending it to each other. Same, the same words keep coming up time after time after time. And what they're doing is they're pretty much signaling, like we, I think, in Twitter, they say, you know, signifiers or whatever they call it, um, identifying who they are and sending that message to their fellow hunters saying, hey, I'm one of you. It's a cult, isn't it? Yep. A cult with a code. Mm. I really don't like these people. You know, how 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 you can mythologize these these people and you know, you know the I hate to use the term, but the SS fanboys who go off. These are horrible, horrible people. But it yeah, you know, okay, I suppose that's 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 me. I'm spacing off here. But the question I suppose I'm I'm trying to get to is does the does the hunt in this idealized I suppose not fied version of it that comes out in, in the thirties. Does this make them, you know, we'll, we keep saying we're going to get onto the actions of the force a minute, but does this, does this make them double down on it because it doesn't matter what you're hunting as long as you're hunting or is that oversimplifying things? Uh, that's actually a very good question, mate. Um, See, the thing that you have to dial back from from that question is, are they only hunting honourable beasts? Hmm. Well, the fact is, no. Because some animals are are determined, uh, um, classified, sorry, as vermin. And other animals are... I don't know what the word is when they're they're not quite the pedigree, so they don't fit the mold. Um, I'm, I'm not sure. It, it's not that they are. Um, 
handicapped in any way. It's just that the pedigree hasn't generated the, the, the correct chromosomes and genes to make them perfect. So I know this will sound boring, but the right side horn is smaller than the left side horn. Okay. So because there isn't symmetry between the two sides of the horn, the animal is like, you know, not quite up to snuff. So, I mean, you get them telling stories about them doing the honourable thing about killing these animals. I mean, I mentioned one in the book, Knuff, um, mm. simply because they couldn't kill him. He was too clever. So he's already, he's already, you know, he's pretty much a degenerate animal in the Nazi way of thinking of degenerate animals in the racist term. But they can't find him because he keeps buggering off and... <laughs> he can't shoot him. Eventually, Goering shoots him, and it's all an honourable thing, and all the rest of it. But um, they have these strange attitudes to what is an honourable beast, a noble beast, a verminous beast, and a degenerate beast. And really, you have to read some pretty tedious stuff to get to the core of what they say. I mean, you know, if you read anything by Lutz Heck, who is the guy that creates mm -hmm. these strange animals called Heck cattle, where they backbreed, they call it backbreeding. I'm not sure how they do it, but anyway, they breed all these cows until eventually they get something that looks like an arrow, which, which is a bl bloody big bull with huge horns. And, but if you, if you read the way he talks for page after page after page, you just going on about degenerate beasts. And you're thinking, well, hang on. Who's the Frankenstein in this game? Mm -hmm. you're, you're creating this stuff and then, and then complaining that your results are crap. And, and this pseudoscience of genetics on top of the race and the technology that's all bound into all of this, it, it, it can get incredibly confusing at times, and you're thinking, hang on, what, what, what planet is this? Because this is all beginning to feel very zog like, and I'm not sure that I can cope with all of this. Um, but they are, it's, it, it, it's incredibly confusing. So you have to find, like I was saying before, where, you know, St. Hubertus being mentioned here, there, and everywhere. You need those signifiers, those identifiers, those highlight points, those key points. Um, to keep you online uh, and, and, and keep you focused because you can very easily drift off. I mean, you know, sitting, sitting reading some of these papers on hunting, um, I mean, apart from the fact that they can send you to sleep because they are incredibly boring. You know, the grass is green. Wow. Grass is longer here than it was over there. And there's a lot more water there than there is over there. And that tree's got a lot of bark on it. And you're thinking, at which point are we actually going to get to what we're supposed to be doing? And what they're actually signifying is, to their fellow hunters, they have taken cognizance of the environment and the terrain they're working with. But to me and you, well, it's just boring. Because yeah? you're not getting to the point. But to them, they're signifying to the, to their, to the cult, as you call them a cult, which is right. They're talking to each other and they're saying, this was the environment that I was working in. Glorifying in the minutia of it more than yeah. anything else. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And let me tell you, to actually boast that you've, you've lain in a river gully in mud for six hours waiting for an animal to come by. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay. <laughs> It's a certain type of person that does that. A total wally. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't. I just can't give credit to somebody. Now, I guess they all gave each other credit for lying in a pond for you know however long. But to me, no. Because in the end, they cheat too. And this is something that I wanted to come back to. 
They cheat because, for example, they climb up on a high stand. Mm. They know the animals pass that way because that's the breeding route. And then they shoot them um, with high-powered rifles from short range with a telescopic sight. And, um, you know, if you speak, if, if you read Raisfeld, he's saying, you know, open sights between 50 and 125 meters um, without a telescopic sight. That makes you a hunter. But by the time you get to Goering and his mob, you know, you only have to look at the guns. And I've looked at the guns from from the period 35 to 42, um, you know, they're, 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 they're the 98K with a telescopic rifle because the 98K was a hunting rifle anyway. It was a man as a hunting rifle, that's how it was designed. Um, and you're going to kill 250, 250 yards? Of course you're going to kill. So, yeah, I... No, all this going up on a high stand, that doesn't convince me, not not a second. I think it's just cowardice, but, you know, it's me. I, I, I suppose it, it plays to all the other compromises that they, compromises is probably the wrong word for it, but the compromises that they made to justify actions. You know, the, the, you know, the, high, the high stand, you know, does, does the high stand justify the the then ceremony over the animal that you've killed you know the, the, the these the, the way they would sort of probably tie it all up in their head to get to the ceremony which may be the important thing to them is you know let's not sit in a pond for six hours let's sit and drink snaps in a in a tree house and wait for the boar to come past well you know you'd think that but they have this silly rule created by Walter Freyver in 37, which is you mustn't take alcohol out with you when you're shooting. So to create Jägermeister. Okay. Well, I thought Jägermeister was a spiritualist drink, but no, apparently not. So you, you can walk around Jäger... <laughs> I don't know. Jäger, Jäger, as, Jäger as non-alcoholic alternative. I, I'm, I, I have some hangovers that would disagree with that. Well, there you go. So they create Jägermeister and they go out hunting with Jägermeister in the pockets, you know, the little bottles. But, but, but Fravert says, you know, you mustn't go, you know, the, the strict rules. If you look at the license card, you mustn't drink. Um, you mustn't be alcoholic. You must kill your animal. And if you, once you've fired, you must make sure that the animal is dead. You have to have a dog. Dog goes with you. Um, you have to have your hunting dog all the time. Where's Gallant's hunting dog? No, it's not there. Because he's looking for the animal on his own. And the number of times that Fravor, who's now written this rubbish, is out hunting without a dog is incredible. I mean, the only time you ever hear of his dog is after he shot himself, maybe shot himself. We don't know whether he shot himself. And the dog sat there you know, being a good dog waiting for somebody to come along and find her. Um, it just seems to be, to me, a strange cult that you create the rules and then you go out of your way to break them all and make them nonsensical. I don't understand that at all. And that's that's the problem, is that the Nazis are bad enough anyway because they never stick with anything that they you know, everything is up for grab. They change, they'll break down their rules, they go opposite ways and all the rest of it. This lot is like another layer of nonsense on top of all the other nonsense that they come up with, you know? Nonsense sum, sums, sums it up. But I suppose once you've bought into it, it'd be, you know, it's, it's not nonsense to you, you know, and, and if it's part of your psyche, you'll pick the bits, I suppose, yeah. It's like religion. You pick the bits of it that you like and try and throw a bit where the bits you, you can. 
That concludes the first part of our chat with Dr. Philip Blood. Part two delves into the operations in the forest itself and we start discussing some of the characters and perpetrators that Phil looks at in Birds of Prey. You can grab a copy of Phil's book as our very own bookshop. If you head to bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash history hack, you'll be able to buy Phil's book there. And of course, all the books from our recent guests as well. But I do highly recommend Birds of Prey. So we will be returning shortly with part two. And we do hope you'll join us for that. As always, thank you so much for listening.